History is usually decided by grand strategy or overwhelming firepower. But sometimes, the fate of an empire hinges on the smallest, most mundane detail. In the summer of 1944, Japan lost its most powerful warship, the Taiho, not to American bombs, but to a ventilation fan. It sounds impossible, yet one catastrophic decision to activate the air system turned an unsinkable fortress into a ticking time bomb. This is the story of how a single flawed command didn't just sink a ship, it dismantled an entire military campaign from the inside. To understand the tragedy, we first have to understand the titan that was the Taiho. By 1944, Japan was losing the war. They needed a miracle, and the Taiho was built to be exactly that. This was not just another carrier. It was a seagoing monster, displacing over 37,000 tons fully loaded, heavier than the American Essex-class carriers that were flooding the ocean. But its size was not its most defining feature. Its armor was. Unlike previous Japanese carriers that had wooden flight decks, the Taiho was the first to be fitted with a heavy, armored flight deck, plated with three inches of steel and sitting atop a hull designed to withstand massive punishment. It was built with a hurricane bow, fully enclosed to smash through the roughest waves of the Pacific. The naval architects designed it to be a damage sponge a vessel that could absorb American bombs, shrug them off, and continue launching aircraft while other ships sought cover. It was the designated flagship, the brain of the mobile fleet, and the personal command center of Vice Admiral Ozawa. The stakes could not have been higher. The Americans were pushing towards the Mar Ia Nas Islands, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. The Japanese high command knew that if these islands fell, the Americans would have airfields within striking range of Tokyo. The terrifying new B-29 Superfortress bombers would be able to rain fire directly onto the Imperial Palace. To prevent this, Japan activated Operation Ego, a desperate all-in gamble. They gathered every available carrier, every remaining veteran pilot, and every drop of fuel they could scrape together. The plan was to use the Taiho as a heavy shield to draw American fire, allowing the lighter carriers to strike a killing blow. It was a solid plan on paper, but it relied entirely on the Taiho remaining operational. On the morning of June 19, 1944, the Battle of the Philippine Sea began. The sun rose over a tense ocean as Admiral Ozawa, standing on the bridge of the Taiho, ordered the launch of his attack waves. Hundreds of aircraft roared off the decks, heading east to find the American fleet. The mood was optimistic. The ship was performing perfectly. But beneath the waves, a silent hunter was watching. The USS Albacore, an American submarine, had spotted the massive carrier. The Albacore was an older boat, and on this critical morning, its technology failed. The targeting computer, the device needed to calculate the complex mathematics of a torpedo shot, malfunctioned. The American captain, out of options, didn't retreat. Instead, he decided to fire by eye, a risky manual calculation at a moving target that was the pride of the Japanese fleet. The Albacore fired a spread of six torpedoes. On the deck of the Taiho, the launch operations were still underway. One of the Japanese pilots, Warrant Officer Sakio Komatsu, had just lifted his plane into the air when he looked down and saw the white wake of a torpedo racing toward his ship. In a moment of supreme heroism that defines the samurai spirit, Komatsu made a split-second decision. He banked his plane hard, put it into a steep dive, and crashed his aircraft directly into the path of the torpedo. He detonated the warhead at the cost of his own life, saving the ship from a direct hit. It was a sacrifice that should have been the turning point. Thanks to his action and the ship's evasive maneuvers, four of the torpedoes missed. 
Tragically, the sixth torpedo found its mark. It slammed into the starboard side of the Taiho, near the aviation fuel tanks. The explosion was loud, but for a ship of this size, it didn't feel fatal. The armored belt held up well. The ship didn't list heavily. It didn't slow down significantly. To Admiral Ozawa on the bridge, it felt like a minor flesh wound. The Taiho was built to take hits, and it had just proven its worth. The damage control teams reported that the forward elevator was jammed and there was a crack in the fuel tanks. But the ship was still fighting. Ozawa, maintaining his composure, ordered the fleet to press on. He believed the thick armor had done its job. However, deep in the bowels of the ship, a silent killer was escaping. The crack in the fuel tanks was leaking raw, volatile crude oil and high-octane aviation gasoline into the lower decks. The mixture began to vaporize. Aviation fuel is terrifying stuff. It is designed to explode with incredible force. And in a liquid state, it is manageable. But as a vapor, it is a bomb waiting for a spark. The deadly fumes began to pool in the elevator well and drift into the hangars. The smell became overpowering. Sailors began to feel dizzy and nauseous. The damage control officer, faced with the spreading vapors, had to make a choice. Standard procedure might have suggested sealing off the affected compartments, flooding them with foam, or even flooding them with seawater to contain the danger. But the Japanese doctrine was aggressive. They wanted to clear the air so the ship could continue combat operations at full capacity. And so, the order was given, an order that would doom the ship more effectively than any American bomb. The damage control officer commanded that the ship's ventilation system be turned on to full power. They opened the hangar deck doors and smashed out the glass of the portholes to try and create a cross draft. The intention was to suck the fumes out of the ship and blow them into the sea. It was a logical idea to a layman but it was physically catastrophic. The Taiho was built with a hurricane bow and an enclosed hull to protect it from the sea, which meant it lacked the natural ventilation of American open deck designs. Instead of venting the heavy gas overboard, the powerful fans acted like a giant blender. They pumped the volatile fuel vapor out of the bilges and circulated it through the ventilation ducts into every single compartment of the ship. For hours, the Taiho sailed on, effectively turning itself into a 37,000-ton fuel-air explosive. This is where the tragedy of the ship intersects with the tragedy of the battle. While the Taiho was slowly filling with gas, the battle in the air was turning into a slaughter. The American fleet, equipped with superior radar and the new Hellcat fighters, was decimating the Japanese air groups. This event would come to be known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. But here lies the critical disconnect. Admiral Ozawa, sitting in the command center of the Taiho, was effectively blind. As the gas spread, it likely affected the crew's efficiency and the communications equipment. Reports were coming in fragmented. Ozawa didn't know that his pilots were being swatted out of the sky by the hundreds. He was operating under the delusion that his fleet was holding its own, perhaps even winning. Because he was still on the flagship, and because the flagship was still steaming at 26 knots, he maintained an offensive posture. If the Taiho had been visibly crippling, he might have transferred his flag earlier, or perhaps realized the gravity of the situation and ordered a retreat to save the remaining ships but the ship's superficial toughness masked its internal rot. The ventilation fans continued to hum, pumping death into the crew quarters, the mess halls, and the engineering spaces. The gas concentration became so high that the sheer friction of the air could have sparked a reaction. It was a deadly trap, and the timer was running out. By the early afternoon, the situation inside the ship was hellish. Men were passing out from the fumes. 
The mixture of oxygen and fuel vapor had reached the perfect explosive ratio. All it needed was one spark. It could have been a generator short-circuiting, a sailor flipping a light switch, or a piece of shrapnel shifting against steel. At 2.30 in the afternoon, six hours after the torpedo hit, that spark occurred. The resulting explosion was cataclysmic. It wasn't just a fire, it was a detonation that tore the massive vessel apart. The armored flight deck, that three-inch thick steel plate that was the pride of Japanese engineering, was peeled back like the lid of a sardine can. The forward elevator platform, weighing tons, was blown hundreds of feet into the air. The sides of the hull blew out. The Falbrest blast was so powerful that it reportedly warped the main deck of the ship into a dome shape. In a split second, the strongest carrier in the Imperial Navy was reduced to a burning wreck. Admiral Ozawa survived the initial blast, but the command structure of the fleet was shattered. Amidst the smoke and the screaming of twisted metal, a chaotic evacuation began. The Admiral had to be transferred to a destroyer, the Wakatsu Ki. This transition was the final nail in the coffin for Operation Ego. A destroyer does not have the radio equipment or the command facilities of a flagship. While Ozawa was climbing down a rope ladder into a small boat, wet and shaken, the battle was still raging. He was completely cut off from the strategic picture. He didn't know that the carrier Shokaku had also been sunk by an American submarine he didn't know that over 300 of his aircraft had been destroyed. Blind and operating on outdated intelligence, Ozawa, once established on a cruiser later that evening, made the fatal error of believing he still had a fighting chance. He ordered the fleet to regroup and prepare for another strike the next day. This delay, caused by the disruption of losing his headquarters on the Taiho, kept the Japanese fleet in range of American bombers for another 24 hours. It led to further losses, including the carrier Hiyo and hundreds more sailors, in a battle that was already lost. If the Taiho had not exploded, or if it had been abandoned earlier, a retreat might have been sounded sooner, saving ships and lives for the defense of the homeland. The sinking of the Taiho was rapid and violent. Following the explosion, the great ship capsized and slipped beneath the waves, taking with it over 1,600 men, along with 13 operational aircraft and all the replacement planes stored below deck. But the loss went beyond numbers. The psychological blow was devastating. The Japanese sailors on the nearby ships watched the Great Phoenix, the literal translation of Taiho, burn and sink they saw their invincibility vanish. If the most heavily armored ship they had ever built could be destroyed so easily, what hope did the older, weaker ships have? In the aftermath, naval historians and engineers analyzed the disaster, and the conclusions were damning. The Taiho did not sink because of the American torpedo. It sank because of a fundamental failure in design and doctrine. The Americans had learned early in the war that damage control was more important than armor. American ships had open hangars that allowed explosions to vent outward. They had strict protocols for fuel line purging. Their sailors were trained that every man was a firefighter. The Japanese approach was different. They relied on passive defense, thick steel and enclosed spaces. They viewed the ship as a weapon first and a home second. The crew of the Taiho was also largely inexperienced. The carrier was so new that the sailors hadn't drilled extensively in emergency procedures. When panic set in, they reverted to a simple command, clear the air, without understanding the physics of the gas they were dealing with. The enclosed hurricane bow, which made the ship so seaworthy in rough weather, turned the vessel into a sealed chamber. When the fans were turned on, there was nowhere for the pressure to go but to build up until the hull could no longer contain it. 
It is a stark contrast to the American carrier USS Franklin, which, later in the war, would be turned into a burning inferno by Japanese bombs, suffering far more structural damage than the Taiho. Yet, the Franklin did not sink. Its open hangar deck allowed the blast energy to escape, and its crew, fanatical about damage control, saved the ship. The Taiho had no such luck. The loss of the Taiho marked the end of the Imperial Japanese Navy as an effective fighting force. With the collapse of Operation Ago, the Americans secured the Mar Ia Nas. Within months, B-29 bombers were launching from Saipan, carrying the war to the Japanese mainland. The pilots lost on the Tiaho and in the air battle were the last of the elite. Japan would never again be able to train replacements of that caliber. The carrier force, once the spearhead that struck Pearl Harbor, was reduced to a decoy force used in later battles not to fight, but to lure Americans away from the battleships. It is a haunting reality of war that the most sophisticated piece of military hardware in the Eastern Hemisphere was undone by a decision that would seem trivial in any other context. A button was pressed, a fan word to life, and an empire burned. The story of the Taiho serves as a brutal reminder that in the complex machinery of war, technology is only as good as the people who operate it. You can plate a ship in three inches of steel, you can build it to smash through typhoons, and you can arm it with the deadliest aircraft in the sky. But if the men inside do not understand the invisible dangers flowing through the pipes beneath their feet, the fortress is nothing more than a tomb. The great phoenix did not rise from the ashes. It created them, leaving behind a lesson written in fire and oil on the surface of the Philippine Sea. War is written in the blood of errors like this one. Subscribe to Fireline to ensure these tragic lessons are never washed away by time.